So given that this is the first app dev focus session, I wanted to come up with a topic that I thought would help cater to developer interest. And so I came up with this theme called log like no one's watching. And the idea is if you could log anything and everything that you want to help simplify your job function, what would you do? And telemetry pipelines, I think, offer a unique perspective and ability that haven't existed heretofore to allow you to be able to capture more insights and make your response times even quicker. So let's go ahead and step through this. I cannot see the room, so if you have a question, feel free to interrupt me and ask a question. But uh, I'm going to try to get through this. We only have about 25 minutes left, but let's see where this goes. So let's focus on developer wants. Obviously, this is a pretty broad spectrum, but in the context of this discussion, Really, developers want to spend more time writing valuable code related to their functional requirements. Conversely, that could be said as they want to spend less time working on non-functional requirements, things like instrumenting their applications. So all this telemetry data that we keep talking about, these metrics, these traces, and these logs, take developer effort oftentimes to be able to instrument their code to output meaningful information that can then be used by their observability systems to understand what's going on. So the question becomes, well, why do we even instrument? Well, it's an insurance policy, really. And the whole reason for implement, or imp implementing application instrumentation in the first place is just as a precaution for when things don't go as planned. When there's outages, we need to be able to understand quickly what's going on there. And that's what this instrumentation is what we depend on. So it's really about preparing for the unexpected. Developers expend a great deal of energy in instrumenting their code. Adding metrics, logs, and traces is not free. They, uh, it takes effort, time, um, you know, it, it takes some planning to do it right. Yeah. And you have to really figure out what context do I, do I need to add so that I can understand what happens when the particular issue is, is occurring. And so, you know, we, we, we spend our time adding logs, metrics, traces, whatever it is that we think will help us troubleshoot a particular piece of code. And then, you know, we then, later deploy this information, oftentimes much later. And then when something goes wrong, you know, we need to be able to rely on that information that we created and try to diagnose the failure. And all of this instrumentation comes at a cost. And it's this curve that Tucker showed earlier where we're now producing larger volumes of data. The cost is going up incrementally, but the value is not keeping pace. All of this information that we're exporting, maybe we'll use it, Maybe a lot of it will just get retained and, and never looked at, but you know, there's, there's probably better ways that we can go about doing this that we can keep the information that we need when we need it, but discard it the rest of the time. So we have to ask ourselves, you know, is all this instrumentation high value? If it's not, we should probably look at better ways of doing things. And so to understand whether or not, or answer the question of whether or not instrumentation is high value, it's helpful to understand why is there so much logging in the first place? And take this typical example, you know, when you're on the hook, oftentimes at two o'clock in the morning on a three-day weekend, um, you need to be able to resolve an outage and you need to do that as quickly as possible. And so therefore you want as much information at the ready as possible. If we lack the granularity that we need in our logs, then troubleshooting obviously takes much longer. So because of this, there's a mindset. It's better to log it and not need it than to need it and not log it. So all of these decisions are taking place at the coding phase. And so we're thinking about as we're authoring our code, maybe we've already been burned once in production by not having enough information. So we had to go through, go back and recode, add more information to help us understand. But this happens at the coding phase. And if we revisit our DevOps lifecycle, we can see that the coding phase happens over here then it could be some time before we actually manage to make it to the operate and monitor phase. And this is typically when the production outage happens. And I know there's a, high, a lot of high performing organizations that can move through an entire life cycle in, in a 10 minute period, uh, oftentimes many times a day, but others, a cadence to their releases. And if I miss this window, I have to wait till the next opportunity to release code in order to be able to kind of add better diagnostics to my operating environment. So the challenge really becomes like when we want to start adding log entries, we have to first determine how we want to classify the log entry. And we typically do this as a level of importance. And so we will typically use, you know, the industry standard debug, info, warn, error levels to categorize, 
you know, the importance of a particular log entry. From there, we go through that DevOps lifecycle where the code is built, tested, shipped to production, and it's eventually executed over some lengthy amount of time. And then if we're lucky, we're using a log management platform that can aggregate all of our logs together. We can see visually, you know, here's, here's the different logs that are showing up in real time. And these are those different log levels that we uh, see in our code. We see all the standard ones such as debug, error, warning, but we see, you know, a bunch of others like, you know, log level 30, 3, 50, 40. What do, what do those even mean? We don't know, but some third party application is probably logging those and now it's showing up in our telemetry. It's great that we can filter on these, but, um, you know, there's better ways of kind of, of, of using this information. And so now that we're logging and, you know, aggregating our logs together, we've promoted our code. You know, the first thing that typically happens is that we turn off log level or for debug logs beyond our dev and integration environments. And it's at that point we start to realize that maybe we've lost some of that troubleshooting granularity that we re relied upon back when we were developing the code. And then some organizations, because their telemetry volumes are so high, we've even turned off info level logs in their production environments, meaning they're only logging warnings and errors because you know that's the kind of volume of, or velocity of logs that they're seeing. Now, we could go in as, in an ad hoc basis and tweak configurations, maybe for certain services or applications or in certain you know, entire environments altogether, we could say, you know what, allow those debug and info logs in production. This often finds, you know, involves trying to figure out where to make that change. We have to apply a configuration change. We have to restart the application to apply the change. All of this is very manual, it's very error prone, and it's very ad hoc. So, and then lastly, if we then determine, oops, we don't have enough information to be able to effectively troubleshoot an, an issue, we have to repeat that long cycle again. So this, this lack of understanding and being able to easily make changes in our environment leads to this idea that, you know, we motivate developers to log like no one's watching and try to co cover every possible scenario from the get-go. And because of this, log volumes grow quickly. So that brings us to the point of, you know, is there a better way? And the idea is that, is there a better way to be able to modify the verbosity of our log stream without changing code, without changing configuration, and certainly without redeploying or restarting our applications? And the idea here is to use a more modern based approach, the telemetry pipeline. And in this particular case, we're gonna use a responsive pipeline. A responsive pi pipeline can either look at the telemetry stream and respond dynamically to different changing conditions, either rapid changes in growth or rapid uh, declines in growth, um, rapid rates of change. Uh, it can actually take external stimulus and uh, coming from uh, your CICD tools or your observability tools and dynamically alter the way data is flowing through the pipeline in response to different conditions. And we're going to talk through some of those examples here today. And so the idea with responsive pipeline is it can understand automatically without user involvement and uh, take appropriate action to either collect more information that it needs or discard information that's no longer necessary. And so as a, as a quick refresher on the telemetry pipeline itself, it sits here in the middle between the things that are producing the telemetry and the things that are consuming the telemetry with the idea that you can actually operate on the telemetry before sending it off to your backend observability tools. So those cases of compliance where maybe you're finding PII information and that you want to get rid of before it lands in your observability tool. A responsive or a telemetry pipeline can do that. Uh, maybe we've made a new release and we want to be able to log more information. We can do that as during this, this, this part of this responsive phase of our telemetry pipelines. And so let's take a look at a, a simple example. In this case, uh, we want to build a simple pipeline that can discard debug and info level logs, but keep warning and error level logs. And so if I click over here, you can see it's very simple. I can basically take my sources of telemetry that are coming in over here on the left. Some of them are actually created with and without log levels. So you can see I have two branches right here. One basically says that there is a 
uh, the, the message itself does have a field called level. And if that's the case, we can look at that to make decisions about whether or not we want to keep this information or discard it. Basically, if it doesn't have a field name level, let's just go ahead and pass it on to our log retention tool because these are you know, logs that we're not interested. Then you notice earlier that I mentioned that mo you know, most organizations standardize on info, debug, error, and warning. But there's always those special cases, especially if we're running third-party software that we have no control over, maybe open telemetry, maybe some Kubernetes service um, that we don't have any control over. It doesn't follow our standardized model. We can actually modify it in motion so that it does map to one of our expected log level with a simple uh, processor within our telemetry pipeline. Essentially, we can look for those log levels of thir three or 30 or maybe just a word log and map those to info. And then if we see a 50 show up, well, that actually maps to our error. So we can do a mapping into a canonical format that our enterprise expects all of its telemetry to, to use. And we can then pass that on to this next processor. And you can see this processor is just configured to simply look for um, info as the level or warn or error or debug. When it finds it, it'll output that event into one of these output paths. And then you can see that for info and debug, we just send it over to our discard pile. Error and warning, we send that over to our retained pile. So we can throw away certain logs based on its logging level and keep the rest. Now back to the original use case, this makes it much simpler for us to dynamically or on the fly change configurations without having to restart applications, change configure code. If I wanted to, I could edit this particular pipeline. I could say, you know what? I actually want to keep info level logs. So I can just take that path, drag it from my discarded pile, move it over to my retained pile, and then I can hit deploy. And now this pipeline is being deployed without having to bounce any services. We're still collecting the telemetry so that it'll pass through the, the pipeline. We're not losing any information. You can see that the pipeline was deployed successfully. And now without any interruption or application changes, we're capturing info level logs and sending it off to our log retention tool. So is it safe to say then, for instance, the unmatched logs, you just said that you can do an alignment to like if the log level 30 or whatever. So that would be a process that would sit in the fork of the unmatched logs. And then you could you know, import a file or import a configuration or create a configuration that says, these types and then filter them based on discarded or retained based on that. Because maybe the 30 level log is just you know, a descriptor and it doesn't really, it's not gonna help you troubleshoot or whatever, but it is something that's important to show that the systems are completing or something like that. Um, yep. don't, okay. And so the idea here is that we've built a pipeline that we feel covers all of the bases in our environment. Yeah. This unmatch always represents data drift. So a new application comes online that we weren't expecting, nobody notified us, we had no idea this was gonna happen. And the idea here is that you would attach an alert to this unmatched rule set here. Mm -hmm. And now if we do have telemetry that comes in that doesn't match any of the other expected criteria that we're looking for, we're gonna get a notification that tells us, hey, there's probably some data drift going on. There's a new log level that's being sent in how do you want to respond to it? And then that way we know we can update our telemetry pipelines to accommodate. Are you able to export uh, a list of unmatched codes? Um, yep. And so okay. as, as part of this operation, we can actually click any of these little tap buttons here. Uh -huh. And so if I were to tap on this, and I probably won't see any because I think I'm handling every condition, but um, let, me, let me back up a, a level. If I tap this particular one, you'll see here's all of my telemetry showing up in real time. And so I can expand this out and I can see the actual contents of the telemetry for that particular log line. So I can see all the labels, all the metadata, so on and so forth. And if I wanted to, I could copy or download this information and save it off wherever okay. I wanted to. Yeah, I could see this being helpful in the development process of getting continuity and standardization on log, um, log leveling and you know, just log consistency, because I mean, it's a huge pain. Yep, yep, and when you have Application services written in multiple different programming languages, all yeah. using their own log framework, as well as third party. You know, having that standardized canonical model is, is kind of nirvana for a lot of uh, DevOps and SRE types that want to have that level of consistency. 
So, you know, that's a very simple use case of filtering out debug and, and info level logs. Uh, but let's not stop there. Like, that's just the tip of the iceberg. Um, you know, log content varies under different operating conditions and different time periods. So take, for example, time of day, day of week, month, year, whatever it is. Different external influences can affect the types of logs or the criticality of logs. Uh, you know, new, new tickets go on sale, a new product launch, open enrollment, so on and so forth, or even a new code release. So let's look through an example of extending that simple use case into one that has more of a temporal aspect of the use case itself. And the idea here is we wanna keep the first couple of steps the same, but we're gonna incorporate a notification from our CI CD pipeline that makes a webhook call into the pipeline and says, hey, there's a new release, here's the timestamp. And then inside of our pipeline, we can check if the last deployment was less than two hours ago, keep everything. Like that's how much confidence we have in our release. We wanna log everything, we don't wanna throw anything away. So let's just, you know, keep tabs on it for the next two hours after deployment. And then after that, we should be in good shape. And so it's pretty simple to extend the existing concept uh, by just changing the routes, for example. And so we have a couple of new debug routes in here. Uh, effectively, there is a recent deployment and I can look at the metadata and say, hey, if the last deployment time was less than 7,200 seconds, just two hours, then go ahead and allow this the, the data to flow through this path. And then if it's greater than 7,200 seconds, take a different path. So this way I can take a recent deployment and retain those logs, or I can take a stable deployment and discard those logs if they're debug level. So these are just different ways that you can utilize a telemetry pipeline to help you know, cover you know, different events that are happening in the enterprise, new releases, new things that are happening externally to the, to the, app, to the environment um, and take advantage of things that you didn't have uh, access to before, uh, but makes it have a single control plane. So you have one centralized location where these rules exist. It's all versioned. You can make changes to this, deploy them when necessary without interrupting your, your services. And so that's kind of the idea of, you know, uh, being responsive. I'm going to go through the, the remainder of this, you know, rather quickly here. But, you know, then, then comes the question, you know, what happens if I'm producing too many logs? And Mesmo has this concept of data profiling. We can monitor your telemetry stream, as Tucker was mentioning, and identify in real time, you know, patterns of, of data that contribute to high volumes and we'll produce a report that shows you, here's the services or the applications that are producing those high volumes. And then you can actually turn your attention to what those different profile patterns are and decide, you know what, are these values that I really need to keep? Or is this something that I can probably do away with under most operating conditions? And so again, it's very easy to extend your pipelines to look at the usefulness of the data, determine which ones I wanna keep, if I'm having an outage, this is the stuff that I need that's most meaningful to me. And, you know, you can make, you can uh, do different things like eliminate, you know, nothing but success calls. You know, when, when proxies log, there's you know, HTTP 200 success code. You know, nobody probably cares about that. It's an endless scrolling sea of information. And we could probably just discard those. And so it's very easy to do that with a pipeline. We just look for that. 200 response code, and then we just send it off to our discard file. Another example is, you know, replacing log entries with metrics. So this happens all the time. Um, oftentimes we don't have a metric tool available at our disposal, so developers will write log uh, metrics out to log lines. We can extract those metrics using a telemetry pipeline, parse the information very easily and readily, and emit a metric, discard the log, and thereby reduce the amount of volume that we're sending to our observability backend. And so as Tucker was mentioning earlier, we actually ran this on Mesmo's own data and the analysis effectively resulted in this screenshot at 73%. It's actually up to about 84% because we found additional patterns that we can live without. And so it's a great way to reduce your overall volume of telemetry that you're producing. And it's not so much to, <clears throat> I, I don't look at it as lowering your costs, but ensuring that you're only sending high value data to your backend telemetry tools, cut out the low, low value data that just generates noise. Yeah, it's just noise, yeah. So being it's able just to get, noise, and it's, yeah. 
preventing you from finding the information that you truly need to want to look at. Right, and by you know turning that into metrics, now you have an opportunity to say, hey, you know what, we were getting these logs that were based on latency. We see an uptick in the frequency of those logs based on this metric that's provided. Maybe we need to open this up, which we can then go into the telemetry profile and say, hey, we actually want to see this for a period of time and then understand like, all right, what is the source of that increase in this type of latency reporting log? Did I describe that correctly? To drive that point home, you got you hit the nail right in the head, but to drive the point home that, you know, it's not just our applications that are producing right. all of this noise. Core DNS, common Kubernetes service. Look at the before and after, 170 megabytes before, five megabytes afterwards. Lots of noise, proxy, Mongo, you name it. Those services are out there and you could probably live without a lot of the information that are, they're producing. So just to kind of round this out real quick, you know, just to recap, you know, we've demonstrated ways that you can use responsive pipelines to eliminate the need to go apply ad hoc configurations and restart applications and services to get better granularity with your logging. Use a telemetry pipeline to be able to apply those changes on the fly. Um, you can then use the, the data profiling to better understand the, the volumes of data that you're seeing and then use pipelines to be able to optimize that data. And so if there's one thing that I want to leave you with today, it's this idea that you should feel free to log like no one's watching. Mm -hmm. So I will take whatever questions you might have. Big question. So is there a way to feed back this information to the development team so they could actually clean up their act a little bit too? I mean, or make sure that they iterate and provide higher value information? Yep. So those profiling reports that I talked about went through really quick, but that's that's the idea is that profiling report will show the application, will show the patterns within that application. You could give that to the developer. I've done it on our own code. I rep through our source tree and I find those patterns within our code base and I identify that, hey, this is probably more chatty than it needs to be. Is there something that can be done? And it's a collaborative process. You know, developers can look at these reports, they can look at the pipelines themselves and they can um, iterate, iterate on them directly or it's a collaboration between <laughs> developers and SREs, that kind of stuff. Yeah, we just need a button inside of, uh, in there to like move this to GitHub issues. But, <laughs> well, I mean, so I'll be a little bit snarky with this though, but they're able to do it. Are you seeing people actually doing it? So there's a couple of thought patterns there. One is with the telemetry pipeline, I don't have to be dependent on a developer. I can go in there and identify those patterns and I can drop those log lines myself. Yeah. Developers, you know, have their own set of uh, priorities, projects that they're working on. Maybe it's an older code base that nobody's opened <laughs> in two or three years and they don't want to touch it. So that's one aspect where they can take control and just cut out the telemetry without having to involve a developer. Yes, we have seen cases where developers are like, oh, yeah, that's probably a bit more chatty than we need, or I forgot I left that in there. Um, you would be amazed at how many like database timings show up in log lines um, that you know are just not needed for production. And so they either change the logging level so that it doesn't show up in prod or they just drop it all together. What's what's uh, the in so just real quick on that one too, I would say like, yeah, we do see it. We do see them doing it and like every time they hit an overage, you know, based on their contract with us, they go do those cleanup things. But then every time that happens, they drift in the next three or four months. Oh yeah, and it's like, and, it, and the thing that's been frustrating for me, trying to, again running in those log management businesses, it's not good for them, nor is it good for me. Like that's not we don't like we don't succeed as a company because someone over accidentally had a configuration change that stimulated some money that then you know, like I have I have costs so we have to cover it, but like it's, it's not success for anyone, and so that so we've really been focused on like how do we make this a systemic pattern or non-dependency, as Bill mentioned. So, Tucker yeah. and Bill. Sorry, sorry. Oh, yeah, I'm sorry about that. How quickly is the enablement for this uh, platform to be integrated into a system like that? Is it based on the developers putting in the code, or is it just sits on it and it takes it all in? Or? Oh, it just takes it all in, yeah. Like, you configure, like, a, um, you're configure, you can deploy an agent, or you configure, like, a source to point to us. And then it's, you, it's not code-based. You don't have to put it in your application or anything like that. It's just a flow of data. No libraries. It's just... Okay. We've we've actually simplified it down that if you sign up for a trial, a free trial with Mesmo on our website, within five minutes you can have your own Kubernetes telemetry flowing into a pipeline. Hmm. 
Yeah, so t Tucker, and I wanted to, and Bill, I, Bill, great present, great, great demo. I liked the way you kind of went through it and, and such. But one thing that you did show on the demo that um, kind of triggered this thought was the adding to the pipeline, the telemetry pipeline. And you mentioned that, you know, Tucker, you were just saying that if you don't make money off like the complexities of it and adding, you know, the, the overage and such, are you providing best practices and ways to integrate into the existing CICD pipe, pipeline so, you, so this is not another set of pipelines to work through? Or is this something that you can just kind of say, well, from a developer or DevOps platform engineering perspective, this is what Mesmo recommends to do it, and this is the best practices to move forward. Bill, I don't know if you have a specific thought on that. Um, yeah, I mean, I in down. the two years that we've been doing this, we have developed a lot of best practices, a lot of uh, trial and error learnings. Um, you know, it gets to the point where there are certain things that you want to do at a pre-processing level. So you want to apply it exclusively, you know, across all telemetry, you know, things like redacting PII, you know, like that, ha that has to come out no matter what. And then you can start to break it out either by service and say, hey, these are my top priority services and these are the kind of considerations that I want to do, or maybe these are just some some information that I just need to log. So there's a lot of best practices that we work with our customers on to help them get the most out of, of you know, their, their processing and their telemetry streams. Well, let me state there's another yeah. quick angle and that might be where you're going is by having all those capabilities, which is really putting those in the hands of the SRE or the platform engineer, oh. you don't have to bother the developer with it. Right. You can provide them, and one of the questions over here, you can provide them that feedback and do continuous improvement and make it better over time but the developer doesn't have to check into this. The developer doesn't have to log into this. Hmm. They can just, we can basically dynamically, they can put the things they want in, the platform engineers or the, the SREs can take those things out from an operational state and then by the flip of a switch add them back in. Totally understand that, yeah. but you also don't want to provide a bag of bits. Yeah. Like if you just give them a bag of bits and they have to put it together themselves, that's complexity. Oh, 100%, yeah. Right. Yeah, so we've got a recipe framework. We're actually in the process of, um, implementing the recipe framework that would give you like a standard library of capabilities and things like that. Yeah, because the one thing I haven't seen in your messaging was actionable insights. Yeah, it's so funny. That's, that word is in a bunch of slides that I took out. But yeah. <laughs> <laughs> like, like, Ajay's going to listen to this. He's our CFO. He's going to be so mad at me. <laughs> it's okay. <laughs> yeah. it up for the next discussion. Yeah, that's right. <laughs> I'm in huge trouble now. Thank you. Uh, no, yeah. That, but, but for sure. There's actual insights on when um, there's actual insights on the data that's going through, and then there's also actual insights, which is more of a roadmap item from us on like how do I get feedback back upstream? Makes sense. Which we're not there yet. It's okay. we've really been focused on the actual insights of the data flowing through as a first starting point. What's the uh, what's the money shot? What's the thing that when you show a customer the the data profiling? The which data profiling? Okay, and which and which one is that? What, um, this one? No, it's the. Well, that's that's that shows you your reduction. That's obviously people like that. That's no, the line um, where they do retain versus. It's all the it's the flow of the. Bill, the can you go yeah. back to that one real quick? The, uh, which one? Are you the, the, the data profiling. I think you might have shown it as a. You might. Have you had a dynamic one yeah. in a browser at yeah. one point. Yeah, he had it. He had it in the browser at one point too, but most people don't understand where the data is coming from. Right, it's hard to see, and this this like kind of changes as it profiles over time. That's that's like the then this will then give you recommendations on recipes to apply to drive the reduction. Um, and so that that is like kind of the one of the cores is like this understanding. But just getting a handle on what you've got, what do, what is all this stuff that's in yeah. massive amounts of blocks? Yeah. And then how do I winnow it down to yeah. stuff you, I can use? Six six observability tools at a minimum. Six agents sending data streams all over the place. You take to your point. I was I was I was sent a note after some of your questions earlier that we've been working on a maturity model which steps you through the things. I think that would have addressed some of the complexity that Alan you brought up too. Well, let me help you with that. Oh, really? Yeah. Good. Uh, yeah. Uh, but but like you you have these six different tools, all these different sources. You don't know what's there. Sure. Yeah. You know, and so that's the hardest first step is getting control over the data. That first step. I mean, so the the. Weird analogy that I put in my mind is like you on your phone, you have like multiple email inboxes coming in. You got one button, all inboxes. You got stuff, you're like, some of this is junk, some of this is important, some I need to filter, some I need yeah. to unsubscribe. 
Their modeling allows you to do that with your data sources. Your but the first time you click one in the all inbox, it's like, like, what, what is going, what on, is going here? on here? <laughs> and I still haven't found that tool for email. I'm very well. Yeah. Yeah. I, I, okay. Spark does that for me. That's, I can't do Spark. <laughs> I've been doing it, but um, I mean, look. Last word. Spark, I'll take the last word. I remember the first time I saw Splunk at a show. They had those cool black T-shirts with nice sayings. But the, the thought that crossed my mind is just because you collect everything doesn't mean you should. Mm -hmm. And it still hasn't changed, but yet our thirst or our desire to collect everything because we can is still out there. And so in my mind, this should be positioned as a tool that sits between collecting everything mm -hmm. and then whatever those six or eight tools you're using over here to do your observability and all of that. This is the this sits in the middle and makes that manageable. The problem is if that's going to be your mission, then you don't want to mess with these. You're not competing with these people. No, you're here, and I think that your CMO has to make that's your message. Mm -hmm. You're sitting in the middle of all of that you, you collect, and all of these tools that you're playing with we make it much more manageable, cheaper, more efficient, whatever you want to talk about. 